All right, this is your lecture on Sonnet 18 by William Shakespeare. Remember that if you want to hear these poems um, read aloud, you go to the Pages section to the left of your Canvas screen, and you click on that, and you'll see where they're read aloud, okay? Um, sonnet 18 is a sonnet written by English poet and playwright William Shakespeare. The poem was likely written in the 1590s, though it was not published until 1609. Like many of Shakespeare's sonnets, the poem wrestles with the nature of beauty and with the capacity of poetry to represent that beauty. Praising an anonymous person, it's usually believed to be a young man. The poem tries out a number of cliched metaphors and similes and finds each of them wanting. It then develops a highly original and unusual simile. The young man's beauty can be best expressed by comparing him to the poem itself. All right, here's a modern, tr modern translation of the poem. Should I compare you to a summer's day, you are lovelier and more mild. In May, rough winds shake the delicate flower buds, and the duration of summer is always too short. Sometimes the sun, the eye of heaven, is too hot, and his golden face is often dimmed. And beauty falls away from beautiful people, stripped by chance or nature's changing course. But your eternal summer will not fade, nor will you lose possession of the beauty you own. Nor will death be able to boast that you wander in his shade, when you live an eternal line set apart from time. As long as men breathe or have eyes to see, as long as this sonnet lives, it will give life to you. All right. Some of the themes um, of Sonnet 18. Um, sonnet 18 is essentially um, a love poem. Oh, I should have told you what the theme was, right? Art and Immortality. Sonnet 18 is essentially a love poem. Though the object of its affection is not as straightforward as it may first seem. The speaker initially tries to find an appropriate metaphor to describe his beloved, traditionally believed to be a young man, suggesting that he might be compared to uh, Summer's Day, the sun, or the darling buds of May. Yet as the speaker searches for a metaphor that will adequately reflect his beloved's beauty, he realizes that none will work because all imply inevitable decline and death. Where the first eight lines of the poem document the failure of poetry's traditional resources to capture the young man's beauty, the final six lines argue that the young man's eternal beauty is best compared to the poem itself. In a strikingly circular motion, it is this very sonnet that both reflects and preserves the young man's beauty. Sonnet 18 can thus be read as honoring not simply to the speaker's beloved, but also to the power of poetry itself, which the speaker argues is a means to eternal life. The poem begins with the speaker suggesting a series of similes to describe the young man. In each case, he quickly lists reasons why the simile is inappropriate. For instance, if he compares the young man to a summer's day, he has to admit that the metaphor, metaphor fails to capture the young man's full beauty. He is more lovely and more temperate. As the poem proceeds, though, the speaker's objections began to shift. Instead of arguing that the young man's beauty exceeds whatever he's compared to, the speaker notes a dark underside to his own similes. They suggest impermanence and decay. To compare the young man to the summer implies that fall is coming. To compare him to the sun implies that night will arrive, and soon. However, as the speaker notes in line 9, Thy eternal summer shall not fade. The young man's beauty is not subject to decay or change. Clichéd natural metaphors fail to capture the permanence, the unalterability of the young man's beauty. To praise him, the poet needs to compare him to something that is itself eternal. For the speaker, that something is art. 
Like the young man's eternal summer, the speaker's lines, such as the lines of his poems, are similarly eternal. Unlike the summer or the sun, they will not change as time progresses. The speaker's lines are thus similar to the young man in a key respect. The poem itself manages to capture the everlasting quality of his beauty, something that the poem's previous similes had failed to express. If the speaker begins by suggesting that the poem is a good metaphor for the young man's beauty, he quickly moves to a more ambitious assertion. The poem itself will give eternal life to the young man. So long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Here the poem's argument becomes circular. The young man isn't like a summer's day or the sun because his beauty is eternal. But his eternal beauty is itself a property of the poem that praises him. His body is as fallible and mortal as anyone else's. He attains a kind of permanence and immortality only because the poem praises him. The speaker thus thinks that poems are eternal, object, e eternal objects, that they do not change or alter as they encounter new readers or new historical contexts. He also thinks that poetry possesses a set of special, almost magical powers. It not only describes, it preserves. The poem is thus not simply a way of cataloging the young man's beauty, it propagates it for future generations. The poem, then, ultimately asks its audience to reflect on the powers of poetry itself, the ways that it does and does not protect the young man against death, and the ways in which it preserves and creates beauty unmatched by the rest of the mortal world. All right, symbols. The first one is seasons. Seasons are units that divide up the year. In Western culture, the seasons unfold like a story. Birth followed by maturity, maturity followed by decay and death. As such, the seasons are often used in poetry as metaphors for the progress of a human life from youth to old age. And in a Christian context, the return of spring after the winter often serves to represent the possibility of resurrection. Sonnet 18 references this tradition at several key points in the poem. The poem opens by asking whether the speaker should compare the young man to a summer's day. In line three, he refuses implicitly to compare the young man to the darling buds of May. In line five, he returns to summer as a symbol, and again refuses it, this time on the grounds that summer doesn't last long enough to represent the young man's eternal summer. The poem thus has a strained relationship with the tradition of using the seasons as a symbol for human life. It invokes that tradition only to refuse it, because the symbol implies narrative, change, transformation, aging, decay. The speaker finds it inappropriate for his purposes. This raises interesting interpretive questions. One might wonder, for instance, if the poem also rejects a Christian model of resurrection which requires death, in favor of its own poetic form of eternal life. Another symbol is the sun. In Renaissance love poetry, the sun is often used as a symbol for physical or personal beauty. Because the sun is the source of all light and life, comparing someone or something to the sun suggests that they are unusually, even exceptionally beautiful. Further, because sun, S-U-N, Sounds a lot like sun, S-O-N. In Renaissance English, the two words were regularly spelled in the, in the exact same way. The sun often becomes a symbol of Christianity and reference to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. In Sonnet 18, the speaker considers comparing the young man to the sun, but rejects the comparison, noting that the sun's beauty is often dimmed by the clouds. In other sonnets, the speaker does compare the young man to the sun, precisely because the sun's beauty is variable. See Sonnet 33, for example, where he refers to the young man as my son, and then complains, he was but one hour mine. The region cloud hath masked him from me now. To reject this metaphor, to say that the young man is more beautiful than the sun because his beauty is more eternal, 
raises questions about the poem's relationship to Christianity. The speaker might suggest here that the young man's beauty and importance rival that of the divinity. All right, we're going to talk about some vocabulary. Temperant. Temperate is used in line two means that the speaker's beloved is not susceptible to extremes. The word often carries moral undertones and is closely related to the word temperance, which suggests moderation and self-control. Yet temperate can also refer to pleasant weather that is neither too hot nor too cold. Shakespeare latches onto the word's ability to reference both emotionality and weather to underscore his beloved's mild, pleasing nature. Lease. Lease in line four means essentially allotted time. Though the word often refers to a legal contract, for example, an agreement to rent an apartment, Shakespeare uses it here to refer simply to a limited span of time. The physical sense of the word does remain present, though, particularly in combination with the later use of the word oust. The implication is that summer does not possess its beauty, it simply rents it for a little while. Complexion. Complexion refers to the natural appearance of the skin, especially the skin of the face. In the poem, the speaker personifies the sun, giving it skin, in order to compare it to the young man's own complexion. The word also has an obsolete sense. It refers to the combination of the four humors of the body. In humoral theory, a person's health and even personality was determined by the mixing of four humors, black, bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm. Though the speaker is probably not referring to the humors explicitly here, Shakespeare's early readers may have heard this alternative sense as well. It suggests a broader reading of the line. Instead of specifically comparing the young man's face to the sun, the speaker might be comparing the constitution of the young man's body to the constitution of the sun itself. All right, another symbol is fair, what, or another vocabulary word is fair. One often uses the word fair when talking about whether something is just or unjust. One might say, for instance, that someone's prison sentence was fair or unfair. Shakespeare uses the word in a different sense. Here it refers to physical beauty. In the Renaissance, to call a man fair was to suggest that he was exceptionally beautiful. There are some remnants of this usage that survive in modern speech. For instance, one might refer to a blonde-haired person as fair-haired. This surviving use hints at some of the implications of the word fair in the Renaissance. It did not simply suggest that someone was beautiful. It implied a specific kind of beauty. During the Renaissance, there was a strong preference for pale skin and blonde hair. Renaissance ladies, for instance, avoid going, avoided going out in the sun, lest they get a tan. To be fair was thus a mark of privilege. It implied that one had the ability to remain indoors, to send servants outside to work. The word fair implies a specific kind of aristocratic beauty, pale and privileged. It thus also suggests that the young man belongs to an elevated class. Your next word is untrimmed. Untrimmed, because the dash, when they take the D out, you have to say it that way to keep the rhythm in the poem. Untrimmed means stripped of ornament or plain. There is a grammatical ambiguity in the line, however. One might read untrimmed as a participle or an adjective. In the first case, the line means something like stripped of its ornament by chance or by nature. In the second, the line means every beautiful thing declines because of chance or because of the unadorned facts of life. Both readings are possible, and as, as is often the case in Shakespeare's poems, the best solution is to keep both readings active at once. The line suggests two things then. First, that nature and chance will strip the young man's ornamental beauty. Second, that nature itself is unadorned, naked, frank, and brutal. Possession, to own or control something. The word ricochets against the word lease in line four. In contrast to the beauty that Summer merely rents, the young man's beauty is his property, 
something he controls forever. The next word is oust. The word is a contraction of the verb own, meaning to possess something. It works together with the word possession earlier in the line to give the strong sense that the young man's beauty is his property permanently. The contraction, however, releases the alternative possibility. Uh, oust sounds a lot like a contraction of the verb to owe. As such, it echoes other Shakespearean sonnets, which in contrast to this poem, meditate on the impermanence of the young man's beauty and describes that beauty as alone. See, for example, Sonnet 6. All right, now we're going to talk about the speaker. The speaker of Sonnet 18 is a subject of considerable controversy. Many people read the poem as an autobiographical statement part of an actual love affair, uh, love affair that the historical Shakespeare had with a young aristocrat. In the movie Shakespeare in Love, for example, Shakespeare writes the poem for his lover, the imaginary lady, Viola de Lesseps, though contextual clues to the sonnet suggest the poem was written for a man. There is no evidence in the poem itself, however, to support an autobiographical reading. Indeed, we don't even know whether the speaker of this poem is a man or a woman. We don't know how long the affair has been going on or what class each partner belongs to. The speaker and the beloved remain anonymous and genderless throughout. We can say that the speaker of this poem is fluent in the cliches of Renaissance love poetry and thus highly literate. The reader doesn't learn much about the speaker from the poem apart from the fact that he, or perhaps she, is in love with someone very beautiful and that he believes in his own poetry will help preserve the beloved's beauty for all of eternity. All right, the setting. Though not explicit, the setting of Sonnet 18 could be interpreted as being Renaissance London, where a passionate affair between the poet and his beloved has begun to unfold. Yet while the poem and the relationship it describes arise from the conventions of Renaissance English love poetry, the poem itself refuses to be located in a specific historical moment. It insists that a poem is an eternal and unchanging object, independent of the historical context in which it is produced, or in which it is read. Whether the poem succeeds in escaping its own historical and social context will thus be a major question for interpreting it. Literary Context Sonnet 18 was most likely written during the 1590s. The sonnet first, encount, uh, excuse me, first entered English in the 1530s and 1540s when poets like Thomas Wyatt began translating Francisco Petrarch's poems. Over the intervening half century, the sonnet became an increasingly popular form, particularly among the aristocracy who used it to write about their illicit affairs and to find favor at court. Shakespeare, who was a commoner, thus approaches the form with some skepticism, interrogating and reformulating its cliches, testing the sonnet to see if and how he might use it for his own purposes. For example, the traditional subject matter of the sonnet is unrequited heterosexual love. A male poet writes about an exalted and unattainable woman whom he adores with a fervor that borders on worship. Shakespeare introduces an important, if not unprecedented, twist to that tradition. The first 126 of his sonnets are addressed to a man. For other homoerotic Renaissance sonnets, see Richard Barnfield's roughly contemporary sequence, Certain Sonnets. Shakespeare's sonnets have become some of the most mildly read and popular poems in the English language, and Sonnet 18 remains perhaps the best known of Shakespeare's poems. In Shakespeare's own time, they seem to have been not particularly popular. They were largely forgotten until Edmund Malone's 1780 edition rekindled interest in them, in part by casting them as autobiographical document, as an autobiographical document, excuse me. Whether we should or should not read these poems autobiographically remains a subject of major debate among scholars. In the context of Shakespeare's sonnets, Sonnet 18 plays an important role. Literary scholars generally group the first 17 sonnets together. They're called the procreation sonnets, 
because they urged the young man to reproduce as a way to preserve his beauty. And nothing gainst time skith can make defense, save, brave, save breed to brave him when he takes the hints. Shakespeare writes in Sonnet 12, These sonnets consider the possibility that poetry might preserve the young man's beauty, and they reject that possibility. But wherefore do not you a mightier way make war upon this bloody tyrant time, and fortify yourself in your decay, which means more blessed than my barren rhyme? Shakespeare asks in Sonnet 16, Sonnet 18 thus marks a major shift in the argument of Shakespeare's sequence. Poetry replaces heterosexual reproduction as a way to preserve the young man's beauty. In doing so, it acquires a powerful and permanent a power and permanence that Shakespeare himself had denied in just two poems earlier. All right, historical context. Although there is continuing debate among scholars about when Shakespeare wrote his sonnets, some say it was early as the 1850s, some say it was as late as the first decade of the 17th century, most agree that they were likely written in the early 1590s, possibly when the theaters were closed due to plague. Certainly by the mid-1590s, individual poems began to appear in compilations like The Passionate Pilgrim. This places the sonnets in the midst of what C.S. Lewis called the Golden Age of 16th century literature, in the same decade that Spencer and Sidney's major works first appeared in print, and that Shakespeare himself wrote some of his most important plays. It also places the sonnets in a period of relative political calm. After years of conflict abroad, Elizabeth had defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Though she was aging, and did not have an heir, she was secure on her throne, a universally admired figure. Though Shakespeare's culture was on the verge of dramatic and violent change, the sonnets, with their focus on domestic matters, affairs of the heart, seem insulated from that change. All right, that's the end of your lecture for Sonnet 18.